Welcome to Alzheimer's Sunrise, lighting the way for patients and caregivers on Legends 100.3. Brought to you by Alzheimer's Community Care, providing help and hope for thousands of families for the past 20 years. Here's Mary Barnes, CEO of Alzheimer's Community Care. Good morning and welcome to Alzheimer's Sunrise, shining a light on patients and caregivers on Legends Radio 100.3 FM. This is Karen Gilbert. I serve as Vice President for Education and Quality Assurance for Alzheimer's Community Care. And I am thrilled to have a very special guest today. We have Dr. Mark Brody. Dr. Brody is the founder of Brain Matters Research, one of the largest, most respected private clinical research facilities in the country specializing in Alzheimer's disease diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. We'll talk quite a bit about that this morning. He is a nationally recognized expert in both Alzheimer's disease and stroke. A former professor of neurology at the University of California in San Diego and stroke program director at Scripps La Jolla, he eventually relocated to Palm Beach County quite a, a while ago, 1995, and was the founding director of the Acute Interventional Stroke Program at Bethesda Memorial Hospital. Dr. Brody is author of Brain Matters, The Prevention of Aging, Alzheimer's, and Stroke. He has appeared with Dr. Oz, presenting current research trends and opportunities in the prevention of Alzheimer's. And that is about the most exciting phrase I think anyone could hear. So we're going to talk quite a bit about prevention about early intervention and what's happening now and what's what's the latest. So we share your passion about prevention. We think it's always better to prevent than to try to treat. So please, Dr. Brody, tell us what's going on uh, in the uh, area of prevention. Well, let's start off with this phrase, if you're not early, you're late. So uh, really, the, there are two abnormal proteins that are culprits of this disease that were described by a guy, Alois Alzheimer's, about 111 years ago now. And so that's what he saw in the brain, these two abnormal proteins. One's called amyloid, and the other one's called tau, T-A-U. So both these proteins shouldn't be there. They're toxic to the brain, and they start to uh, melt away brain cells and connections. And th these abnormal proteins are building up at least 10 to 15 years before anybody gets a symptom. So the brain's powerful enough and has the ability to compensate and has neuroplasticity to take over for circuits that are going down, but there's a limit. When the healthy brain can't keep up with the circuits that are going down, you start to get symptoms. So the idea, the holy grail as it were, would be if we can identify people who are at high risk and we can see these proteins developing and forming in the brain and, they, and people don't have symptoms and we treated them the Holy Grail would be, and they never know what they missed. So that's, that's uh, prevention would be kind of the, our version of the cure because we don't have a cure, and most of the research is really based on can we put people in remission? Can we keep them where they're at? Can we keep mom or dad as good as they can be for as long as we can without making them sick? That's ringing the bell. But prevention is we don't have to ring a bell. It never rings. And so uh, I went to uh, the clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease in Toulouse, France, about six, seven years ago. And the head of uh, Neurology University of Tel Aviv got up. He was the final speaker. And the topic of his lecture was, why don't we have any drugs that work yet? And he got up and he said, you can't go to the cemetery, rip up the headstones, and resurrect the dead. We're too late and walked off the stage. So that's the same gentleman that I brought with Mary Barnes and Alzheimer's Community Care to Scripps yes. about a year and almost two years ago yes. because we're both passionate about prevention. And this leads to what can you do proactively to try to forestall the onset of Alzheimer's and modulate the rate of progression. Well, in an earlier uh, discussion, we talked about this notion, as you say, that we have that opportunity to act up front. Acting later has not produced many results. Treatments that are 
uh, targeting patients who are already in middle stage disease where apparently most are diagnosed. That, that shorter, earlier stage is missed. Right. It's uh, misunderstood as normal aging, right. changes of normal aging, which we know they are not. That's the moment to act. But of course, always better is prevention. And that knowledge that there are things we can do proactively is very powerful. Many people believe that because of other members of their family that were diagnosed with Alzheimer's, uh, they've inherited a gene and they are doomed. Right. And we're learning now that it's not all genetics. Your lifestyle can have very uh, significant impact no matter what you inherited. Right. So if you know, if you imagine that there's a platform with little pins underneath it, so those pins are genetic markers that are associated with increased risk, but the platform is stable on the pins. So it's not just do you have the gene, it's have you had head trauma, do you have diabetes, do you have hypertension, were you a smoker, have you ever had a stroke? So all those pins are, have different uh, levels of impact on the platform, so they have different heights of the pins. So. As long as the platform is staying level on the pins, you don't have clinical disease. But when there's a shift of the pins, whether it's the genetics or lifestyle or other diseases that are risk factors, then the platform starts to shift. And then when it's moving on the pins, then we recognize that as clinical disease. But all the, the pins underneath the platform, they're moving and well, they're going up and down and so on. And that's our understanding of which pins are the most important, how many pins there are constantly being updated. But we, what we need to know is we need to, we need to intervene before the platform starts moving off the pins. And it's kind of that's what we call uh, the tipping point. So when you hit the tipping point, then the disease starts and everything's got momentum. And so we'd, we'd like to avoid uh, hitting the tipping point. Now, I've heard you speak many times, and you have an incredibly uh, wonderful way of explaining this. Um, what I think is new to a lot of people is viewing particularly Alzheimer's, and we talk about Alzheimer's so much because it is believed to be the, the most common irreversible cause of symptoms of dementia. Right. Uh, but the recognition now that it is multifactorial, it's not one thing. Right. It's, it's not one, and, and that's an important distinction. And there's a distinction with a difference. So what, what we call Alzheimer's, and Alzheimer's is far and away the most common type of dementia, about uh, 75%. Kind of what I'm getting at is if, in fact, you have some r obvious risk factors, and one of them would be somebody in your a direct family relative has a history of Alzheimer's. Statistically, that puts you at a 40% increased risk over the general population. Now, if you have some of the genes we've identified, and now there's the ApoE4 gene is the one everybody talks about, but we're up to about 10 or 12 genes that we have a, an association with. It doesn't mean you're going to get the disease, but it statistically puts you at a higher risk. Higher so risk. what I'm it's saying is the distinction with the difference is everything we call Alzheimer's disease is really a syndrome because people who get the disease before age 60 which is technically called early onset early disease onset. they don't they don't have most of them don't have risk factors like hypertension or diabetes or smoking anymore but they have their their disease is highly genetically loaded whereas people who right. are 78 and 82 they may have all those other risk factors and more more so the the general age related which is it true that over 90% of alzheimer's will be the typical age-related, and that the early onset is that presenilin one and two. Not necessarily. Uh, so there are some, there are some <laughs> genes that really, uh, and, and th they're they're not that common. But there are people who have this ApoE4 gene, mm -hmm. and right? There's six varieties. It's kind of like a, an expanded uh, table, so you can have. Uh, these little alleles, so that you get ApoE22, 2, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3, and it works up to, if you have 4, 4, you're mm -hmm. at 20 times increased risk over the general population. 
that's homozygous. If you have 3, 4, which is called heterozygous, because you have 1, 3, and 1, one four, 4, you're at about 4 to 6 times risk. Doesn't mean you're going to get it, but let's say you have 4, 4. That's 20 times risk is significant. That's a significant increased risk. So that person would would uh, certainly have the incentive to be even more focused on those lifestyle factors that push those pins you talked about. Exactly. So they can still have control potentially over their overall risk by paying attention to those other factors. In other words, I've never heard anyone say this is 100% genetic no. and nothing you can do. So that's been very encouraging and very recent. So in a perfect world, everybody is adopting as many of those preventive lifestyles as they can. But let's say they miss that opportunity and now they are at that earliest point. And that to us would be worst case scenario, that you're acting when you're starting to realize there are right. symptoms but of it, dementia. But, but it's not too late then. I mean, if you address controlling your blood pressure, optimizing the treatment of your diabetes, you quit smoking, you try to avoid hitting the pavement with your head or other people, um, and you uh, modify your medication for controlling your cholesterol, you get restorative sleep. These are all things you can do that will slow down the rate of progression. So if you were to have the disease early on, you can do all these things and, s and not just look for this new breakthrough treatment to try to put in your remission. You can slow things down by changing lifestyle and addressing modifiable risk factors. It's not too late. And that's huge. And that is not general knowledge yet. And I go out and talk quite a bit in the community, and people are astounded to hear that, that they actually could have an impact. Thank you for uh, listening to Alzheimer's Sunrise, shining a light on patients and caregivers on Legends Radio 100.3 FM. You can call us at Alzheimer's Community Care at 561-683-2700 or send us an email, info at allscare.org. That's A-L-Z. C-A-R-E dot org. And if you do, please tell us you heard us on Legends Radio. And in a bit, we're going to give contact information for Brain Matters Research. So tell us um, what kinds of studies are being done for those who may have recognized early symptoms and are motivated to do all that they can, even though they are showing symptoms, to delay progression. Right. So the research that we do is pharmaceutical sponsored clinical research under the umbrella of the FDA. So none of this is, there's no guinea pigs here. Mm -hmm. We're not experimenting. These are investigational trials. That means that we have to show safety and we have to show that it's actually working. And those trials start at the beginning where it's phase one. It's the first time we introduce a new drug to people with the disease all the way up through phase three, which is the last step before you go to the FDA and say, here are results of, you know, I'd like to be approved, mm -hmm. we're, we're, um, we're, we're trying to get approval, and then it would be available on the market, whether it's a pill you get at Walgreens or it's an infusion that you get in your doctor's office. So we are doing all those studies, but there's a number of studies that are further along and in phase three they're international trials so that's you know Canada here in the US Europe South America and there's a number of trials and th that are close to going to the table so that's exciting and uh, then you know the other thing is there's a famous American philosopher it's my favorite American philosopher Yogi Berra yes right so it never happens till it does and so we never get a breakthrough till we do, but we never do unless people come in clinical trials. And never so, going to happen. And what, some of what we've heard uh, when we discuss clinical trials, because we want our families to know that this is available right here in Palm Beach County, and uh, Brain Matters Research can be reached on the internet, brainmattersresearch.com, or by phone at 561-374-8461. One of the things we hear is, well, I know that some people get the placebo. So if I'm not going to get the drug, why should I enroll? Please, right. please speak to that. So one is that even before we get to that point, not everybody who has memory problems has Alzheimer's. 
15 and 20 percent of people I see have fixable things nobody's really looked so that means your thyroid's out of whack, your B12, you've had some small strokes you don't know about or a small benign tumor, uh, or you're depressed, or you're having a drug-drug interaction. Those are the big things. And we, we, f we go through that systematically, and we find that, that those conditions can mimic memory problems that look like Alzheimer's, but they're fixable, so you've got to look. But let's say we go through that whole process and we say, yes, it, this looks like m early Alzheimer's. And so really what this looks like is we have four drugs out there they're band-aids you get a little bang for your buck early they do nothing to amyloid or tau the two culprits and after uh, a short period of time where you may get a little bang for your buck early then everybody continues to get worse and everybody dies it's, it's a blunt thing to say but everybody gets worse and everybody dies there are no exceptions if you have the diagnosis right, right and it's accurate so the whole idea is when you're thinking about placebo with a terminal disease, it's like you have terminal cancer, slowly progressive terminal cancer, and you're in a research study. So if you had slowly progressive terminal brain cancer and you're here in Florida and there's medications that can just sort of symptomatically help a little bit for a little while and there's ongoing research study um, and, and you could go up to New York or MD Anderson would you go? And the answer is almost everybody says yes. Yes. Well, for this disease in this part of the country, we are Sloan Kettering. We are MD Anderson. And so when you're in a study for cancer, you can get placebo. If you don't come in a study and the natural history of the disease is everybody gets worse and everybody dies, then not coming in a study means you have a hundred percent chance of not getting a breakthrough trial. So in most of the trials, it, at least there's a 50-50 chance you get At the, the outset drug. when right. you first enroll. Right. And then after a period of time, it's usually 18 months, then everybody gets Everyone the drug. Everyone gets the drug anyway. We know that. So, and, and again, we are so fortunate to be where we are, to have so much research going on right in Palm Beach County. Uh, you know, we always want families who call us to understand that these things are available. Right. Uh, of course, it's optional. They need to evaluate the potential benefit versus the risk of not acting uh, and decide what's right for them. So that's very important. Knowing they would eventually get the drug after a certain amount of time um, is very, very important. So uh, if, we're, if we have clinical trials that are addressing early disease, what are we seeing? Have we had enough time to see if we can appreciate slower progression, or are we still in the infancy of those studies? We, we, we're fairly far along. We've had some studies that have shown slowing, um, but they didn't meet the criteria that they set out. They said to the FDA, our, we propose that our drug will cause a certain significant amount of slowing. And they didn't meet those milestones, and so they didn't get approved. The, the issue is that the payers, the insurance companies of the world, and Medicare have basically said, we want to see clinical, meaningful results. And the ballpark is that we're looking for 25% slowing or more. Because these drugs are expensive, and they say, we want to know that it's cost effective to give people these treatments. So the bar's relatively high. It's high. Right. But we're getting there now you were i know we talked before we we, we went on air about uh, a study that biogen is running is but you know it's, it's it's in the press and it's an engineered antibody to the toxic amyloid in the brain so it's actually given intravenously and goes through the veins and goes up to the brain and gloms onto the amyloid and uses your immune system to literally dissolve it we've had a number of trials in that sphere that haven't um, been approved yet, it, what's a little bit different about Biogen is they're human antibodies. They're not humanized antibodies. They're culled from people and put in a package and then we give them to you. And so that's different than kind of engineering an antibody and from a mouse and then what we call humanizing it f from an immune standpoint so there's not a reaction to it. Um, so that's in the last phase and uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of uh, excitement because the preliminary results look like we're dissolving uh, about 30 to 35 percent of the amyloid. 
over a, about 18 months, and that people are staying stable out to three and a half years if you continue the treatment. So that does that mean then that they had enough functioning brain, enough functioning neurons to um, benefit from that plasticity that we talked about, being able to work around those bad areas. So it would seem reasonable that again, acting early right. is it's a, so important. It's a, it's a numbers game. It's a little like infections, right? So once the infection has really started spreading, it's harder to treat. And once you've lost a lot of synaptic connections, then it's harder to make an impact. So the earlier, the better. So a later study, uh, for a later patient rather, mid-stage or going toward late stage, you may successfully clear amyloid, but they don't improve because they've already had so much destruction. Right. Yeah, let, let, let's clarify things. We can't, we can't this, when people have the disease, we can't make them better what we might be able to do is keep them from getting any worse. worse, right? And so, and that's a big deal, right? We want to keep you as good as we can for as long as we can without making you sick. We want people to have a life. People have trouble with short-term memory, and maybe we can't fix that, but they can talk to the kids, they can drive a car, they can go out with friends, they can read a book, they can, they can go their to life. They have a life. And the longer we can keep them having a functional life, is the goal. So if we can change things where we slow things down or put people in remission for three years, this is a, this is a huge deal. It huge. Is. It is. It is. Now tell us the most exciting thing of late, stem cells. Right. Tell us about that. So stem cells has kind of been this buzzword. Everybody's excited about it. Nobody knows what it means. And then there's been some kind of uh, shady places that say they can do everything with your own stem cells. Well, now in the last five years, there's real evidence that stem cells in neurodegenerative disease, including ALS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, is showing some real promise. And so the f we've we've begun with the first stem cell trial for Alzheimer's disease. And that just began recently. That began recently. And we take, the stem cells come from donors, to healthy 20 to 30 year olds. And they call these stem cells out. We make sure there's not gonna be an immune reaction, a clash between those stem cells and your body. And then we give them intravenously. And it's, a, it's literally a one infusion thing. And then we follow you for a year. So what happens is we, we tone down the inflammatory reaction and we think that we're allowing the, na the brain's natural, natural ability to regenerate and facilitate that. But there used to, we used to say when you hit uh, early teens, you, it was as good as you can get, it's all downhill from yes, there. Yes, and no and, plasticity after And you 20. don't make any new brain cells. Right. It's not true. You make new brain cells even as you age, but slowly. So we're all looking, what can we do to maintain that? Can we put fertilizer on that? What can we do to make that better? And so there's a, one of the ways is stem cells. And so that study has started, that's exciting. Another thing that's going on is there's a fellow from Harvard called, his name's Tansy, and his, his feeling is there are certain people who we, we say has Alzheimer's who actually have an infection. Oh. And now we're gonna start to treat people with uh, antibiotics and antivirals and people who have uh, gum disease periodontitis yes. puts them at risk and those yes. same bugs that are in their gums are in their brain yes, yes. and so that's kind of a departure from uh, kind of a, wh the way people have been doing it but we never thought that ulcers were caused by infection. That's right and that would say that would put another preventive strategy on your list which is dental care Right. And as a former operating room nurse, I worked on many brain surgeries that were abscesses that originated with uh, right. poor it's dental It's a direct care. window from the gums into yes. the brain. And so uh, that's really fascinating. And so those studies are starting. Um, and so e everybody's uh, trying to come up with something. This is where capitalism works. And a lot of people, smaller companies, are thinking outside the box. So we're gonna come up with something that's gonna ring the bell, and it may not be what we thought, but uh, I'm convinced in the next few years we're gonna have a breakthrough. Now, 
What That's does exciting. the next few years mean? I don't know. And you never know when you're going to hit a gusher. But it only takes one. I did stroke research for 17 years. We used this blood clot dissolver called TPA. TPA. And it, mm -hmm. it changed how we pe treat people yes. with m the most common type of stroke. And strokes. they recover many if they're treated quickly right. with no long-term disability. Right, exactly. So that's we're looking for that breakthrough for this disease, for Alzheimer's. Dr. Brody, this is fascinating. It's exciting. It's encouraging. It's a huge change from what so many people have believed. You will be speaking again, expanding on this at our educational forum on Thursday, May 17th at uh, uh, the PGA uh, National Resort and Spa. We are thrilled. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Brody and his team can be reached at brainmattersresearch.com on the internet or at 561-374 8461. And this is Alzheimer's Sunrise shining a light on patients and caregivers on Legends Radio 100.3 FM. You can reach us at Alzheimer's Community Care at 561 683 2700 or by email info at allscare.org, A L Z C A R E.org. And if you do, please tell us you heard us on Legends Radio. Thank you again, Dr. Brody. This is so exciting. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to Alzheimer's Sunrise, lighting the way for patients and caregivers. To learn more about the help and hope available from Alzheimer's Community Care, call 561-683-2700 or visit allscare.org. That's A-L-Z, care.org. Tune in next Sunday at 630 for another edition of Alzheimer's Sunrise, lighting the way for patients and caregivers right here on Legends 100.3.